Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. We hope you're, you're having a great midweek. And I'm Jasing from the Google Developer Relations team. And this is um, the Go SG team and the speakers who will be joining us today. Uh, before we begin today's session, I uh, just wanted to briefly introduce who we are and what we do. Google Developer Space is a platform for developers and startups from around the region to learn and connect with one another. And we are really excited for the awesome speakers and sessions we have lined up today. Um, I think earlier today, we were trying out for the first time uh, Gather Town. So uh, I think Techchun and Stanley, they'll share with you more on how you can join us uh, over there to network um, virtually with the speakers as well. Yep, over to you, Techchun and Stanley. Hello, good evening. It's another month again. So time really flies. It's like half a year is gone. And uh, this is the sixth, the sixth, I think, sixth or fifth for the year. Really, really fast. All right. Uh, yeah, good to know and good to see all of you again. Yeah, hope we've been staying safe. Um, yeah, Gather Town, this is the first time we, we are trying that out. Uh, if you're registered with your email, you can try and click on the link that is in the invite and uh, lock on with the same email that you registered for and uh, choose an avatar and then you can enter there. Yeah. Uh, if you go there now, it's going to be a ghost town because there's no one there. It's, we're all here uh, trying to organize the talk. But uh, in the break, uh, we look forward to seeing you there for 15 minutes. Mingle about. Uh, we'll be at a bar. You, you'll find a bar at the left side of the map. right? If you enter the map, virtually go to the left, far left, and you will see a bar. We'll all be there. right? But there'll be no drinks. Uh, but um, <laughs> Sorry to say that, we can have your own drink at home. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, today we have two speakers, and uh, sorry, I should introduce my co-organizer, Stanley. You see that Stanley can give a wave, yeah. Hello, Stanley. Yeah, and thanks to Jia Sing uh, once again for supporting us on this. And one more, one more organizer is Abel. Is not on the screen right now. Maybe you can find in uh, Gather Town. He's probably drinking alone. Maybe. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and we have two speakers today. Uh, we have Andre. And we're Donaldson, right? Um, we have two talks, and Andre is going to talk to us about um, um, an important topic. Uh, let's see. I want to uh, find it. <sighs> right, sorry about that. So Andre is a founder of Enco uh, Dev. is a is, is a go a backend framework for building a distributed systems. Uh, he was an ex Spotify staff engineer, and also a part time a puppy caretaker. So he's going to take us through uh, this uh, static analysis and code generation uh, using Go, uh, and uh, which can compile into distributed systems. Right, that's Andre, and uh, Donaldson. Uh, is going to teach us or show us how not to program in Go. Right? Uh, and Donaldson is a senior engineer at uh, Quinrus, and uh, he's been a systems programmer with a keen interest in this kind of large-scale computer networks. Right. All right. Um, without further ado, uh, let me introduce Andre. And over to you, Andre. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, great to be here, everybody. Uh, real pleasure. My name is Andre. I am the founder of a startup called Encore, which uh, I'm here to talk a bit about today. Uh, long time Gopher started programming in Go back in 1.0. Uh, at that point, I was at Spotify, so was doing a lot of uh, backend development, distributed systems, and so on. And I built built a lot of Spotify's internal infrastructure for Go. And when I'm not doing that, I am taking care of a little puppy called Salvador. Uh, he's incredibly cute and very very playful so we'll see if he interrupts uh, this talk but right now he's he's sleeping and so i'm here to talk about distributed systems which is what i do in my day job and have been doing for a long time and maybe a better way to express them a more natural way to express them uh, to try to get rid of some of the complexity surrounding that and to maybe frame the problem a bit more in my experience, when you're building a backend, like you have this idea in your head about what you're trying to do. And usually it's something simple. Like, oh, you're getting some data from an API and then processing it and then storing it in a database and then you're done. But there's incredible amounts of boilerplate that surrounds 
the core functionality that you're doing. That ends up being where you spend a lot of your time. And when you're building a distributed system, you're just not dealing with one part. You're actually dealing with hundreds or even thousands of moving parts that you're trying to get to work well with each other. At Spotify, we had several thousand backend services. And there were so many that we didn't actually know exactly how many there were, which sounds crazy, but is the truth. And even when you're a small team, the moving parts ends up being like you're just both writing your own parts, but you're also combining that with infrastructure in the cloud and different tools that you're connecting together and external APIs and so on. And the end result is an overwhelming amount of complexity, right? Like the applications we're building, they seem so simple to use, whether it's Spotify or Airbnb or Google, right? Like they feel super simple, but the complexity under the surface is just incredible. And that's a problem because it means that building that software is much slower than we would like because we're constantly struggling with all of this complexity. And so maybe to illustrate it a bit more, right? Like when you're building a backend, usually the way it works is you have some sort of front end that's communicating with it. And inside your backend, you're writing some business logic, you're talking to some external API, you're doing some processing, you're talking to another backend maybe, and then you're storing some data in a database, and then you're returning some data back to the front end. And if you just do this, and most backends are just variations on this idea, right? And if you do this over and over for 15 years, you end up building Spotify pretty much. It's really, in concept, it's not that much more complicated. It's just a lot of work, right? But it seems really simple when you look at it this way. The reality is, even for something super simple, there's a lot more to it, right? So we're talking, in, you need a build system to actually build the code you're writing. You need a deployment system. Usually these days you use Kubernetes and then you need to provision the database. You need secrets for connecting to the database, like a database password or an API key. You need to actually manage a database connection pool and servers and migrations and transport protocols and DNS. You know, it's like an endless list of stuff. And all of this stuff on the right is actually not really about your application. Everybody who's building for the cloud have exactly the same problems and they're doing all of this work the same way that you're doing that work. So it's not differentiated in any way. It's not unique to your uh, backend. And what's more is there's nobody that can actually help you do this work because you are the only one who actually understands how your backend is supposed to work. So the only one who can actually do this is you. And that is a problem because it means that what seems really simple ends up being you know, months of work just to have something working in production when it should be days. And so a lot of this is about infrastructure. And so there is this concept called infrastructure as code, which is really about instead of clicking around in the user interface, maybe we could just write some code to define the infrastructure that we need. And that gives us some, you know, it makes it more uh, reliable because you can check it into source control. It's more reproducible if you wanna tear it down and create it from scratch and so on. Um, so here's a, for exa an example. This is using Pulumi to define like a GCP a network with a firewall and a compute instance. But when you do this, you're essentially just writing more code, right? Like we're not doing less work. We just replaced clicking around in a UI with writing more code. And since they're different, uh, we end up 
over time, it's very common that they diverge, right? And um, what you write in your application might not match exactly the infrastructure code that you're writing, or the infrastructure as code part ends up going out of sync with your uh, cloud infrastructure. And it ends up being very production centric, right? Like what we're looking at here, it's really only the configuration for production. If you want a test environment, it's going to look a bit different. For local development, this doesn't work at all, right? Your computer is not in uh, running in the cloud. It's on your computer. So it ends up being a bit of a letdown, even though it has good ideas. It doesn't really solve the problem. And so what I realized is if you look at, you know, when you're writing a backend application, it's really about in your head, you have this idea of how the application should work. So you have this, you know, uh, system diagram where you have uh, relationships between services and how they interact and so on. And this is really what we're trying to do with our infrastructure. We're taking this idea and we're trying to translate that into actual infrastructure. So if I have this architecture diagram with three different, uh, sorry, four uh, different services, one of which is a front end and then three back end services, we have three different uh, databases, one for each service. We have some events, which is like Google PubSub or whatever. It's pretty straightforward to go from this picture to the infrastructure that we want. You know, most people who are comfortable with the cloud could do this, you know, it's pretty straightforward and obvious how you would translate this into cloud infrastructure. And the problem is our tools don't understand this, right? Like this picture is only in our heads. And what we would like is for our tools to achieve the same understanding but they don't. And if they did have that understanding, then maybe they would be able to help us in a better way. So I had a, a bit of a crazy idea, right? A couple of years ago. And I thought, uh, if we could teach our tools to understand what we're trying to do, then they could be much more helpful. And if they had really understood this picture of our systems, they could use that to you know, set up all the infrastructure and, and really help us to do what we're trying to do when we're building our backends. So that's what we built. The core idea behind all of this is what we call the Encore application graph. And it's essentially a way to uh, write a backend like a distributed system in a way that we can build up this picture uh, that we have in our heads. And by doing that, our tools can be much more helpful in you know, really helping us create uh, and build our backends much, much faster than before. So I'm going to switch over to a quick live demo and, and show you what I mean by this, and then we'll get on with the rest of the presentation. There we go. So what we're looking at here is, this is a very simple picture of our backend application. And right now there's nothing in it. It's just a, a load balancer, which doesn't send data to anything. So what we wanna do here is, and I'm going to zoom in a bit so we can see better. Uh, I'm going to try to replicate this picture that I just showed you with like an order management system and a payments gateway. So first thing we do is we create some uh, a backend service just by creating a folder. And we're going to call this the order service. I'm going to make this on the side so we can see it while we do this. And so now I'm doing this with Encore's 
uh, syntax. So with Encore, you define APIs by using this annotation and you create a function. So here we're creating the order.create endpoint. And we'll, we'll just say that it returns an error and nothing else. And once we save, we can see that Encore updates its application model to see that, oh, now there is an order service here. Uh, and that's based on understanding that this is defining an API. And that means that this package is a microservice. And what we can then do is we can create another service. Let's call it the payment service. And in here, we'll do the same thing. I'll even copy paste this. Instead of payment, we'll call it pay. <laughs> and now you can see that uh, we now have two services in our application model. Now this is called public, uh, but we don't want the pay endpoint to be public. We actually want it to be uh, private because it's not going to be exposed in the load balancer. It's going to be called from the load uh, from the order service. So when I make it private, you can see that the load balancer is no longer connected to it. And if we go back here, this is just an example. So I'm just going to. Uh, illustrate how this works, we can say payment.pay. We'll pass in the context. And so with Encore, when you have two different services, the way you do an API call between them is you import the other service like this, and then you call the function as if it is a regular function. And this is how Encore understands that we're actually doing an API call between services. So now when I save, you can see that the application model is updating its understanding. And now there's a relationship from order to payment. Because Encore understands that the order service is actually doing API calls to the payment service. We can go even further and we can create, let's say that in the payment database, in the payment service, sorry, we want to have a database where we keep track of all of the payments. So with Encore, you do that by creating a migrations folder. And payment. This is just an example, so I'm going to keep it, keep it simple. If we go back here, what we want to do here is we want to use Encore's SQL database package. We import that. We're going to execute uh, a query. And now when I save, you can see that since we import the database and we do a database query, Encore updates its understanding of the payment service and understands that this payment service actually wants a relational database attached to it. And this is a very simple example, and it's you know it doesn't actually do very much, but it illustrates you know how we can create this concept where you're just writing business logic, and our tools understand how our distributed system should work. And this is really the core idea behind Encore, is do this, but take it much, much further so we can actually do real-world applications uh, in this way. Now I'm going to go back and to the presentation. And so the core idea behind all of this right, is we want to be able to develop distributed systems. And the concepts that we want are things like services and API endpoints uh, that I just showed you, doing API calls, request uh, parsing and analyzing request and response schemas and secrets and so on. 
And we also want on the infrastructure side to be able to understand things like the databases we have, the schemas, uh, when we're using blob storage like uh, S3 from AWS or Google Cloud Storage and so on, when we're using caching and distributed queues and PubSub and so on and so on. And these are the sort of primitives that we really want in our you know, framework to be able to build distributed systems incredibly quickly. And this is what we're doing with Encore. We're taking all of these concepts and we're making them like providing a standard way of expressing that that enables us to really understand what you're trying to do and help you do that quickly. And just to give you a quick idea of how this works is we have, you know, in the same way that a compiler works, when you're uh, compiling Go code, it takes the code and turns it into an abstract syntax tree where the nodes in the tree are things like function literals and if statements and uh, binary expressions and so on. And with that syntax tree, we can then uh, do a bunch of compilation passes to turn that into machine code. And this is a very, very big simplification, but it, it explains the core idea. And the way Encore works is essentially the same thing, but where the syntax tree that we're creating are not function literals and, and binary expressions, but really um, distributed systems concepts. So like microservices and databases and endpoints and API calls and so on. And with that syntax tree, we can compile that into you know, infrastructure and distributed systems uh, uh, solutions to things like, you know, setting up all the infrastructure, uh, but we can also do a lot more. So we can generate code to reduce boilerplate. We can generate API documentation. We can even simplify debugging through distributed tracing and so on. And so this is really what Encore is all about. So now I'm gonna show you a demo of the actual product. So if we go back here, we are going to so the way Encore works, right? Is uh, we start with a back, uh, creating an application, and that application corresponds to our uh, complete backend, right? It's not a, a microservice; it's everything. So we can say go sg demo. We can choose a few different templates, but I'm going to choose the Trello clone just to um, give us something to work with. And let's open it up in our editor. Oops. And there we go. So with Encore, when you're, uh, we're going to look into the code a bit, but to actually run an application, you just type Encore run. And the first time it takes a few seconds to do all the compilation and so on. And then you can see that it's registered all the endpoints. You can see the, the API pass for actually calling the API and so on. But it, it's quite hard to understand a backend by just looking at the code. So I'm going to, we've actually built a, a custom front end that connects directly to our backend just to explain a bit what's going on. So this is a Trello clone. I'm going to choose the local development. And now we're connected to my computer. So here you can create a, a board. You can create columns. You can create uh, cards. You can drag them around. If we refresh, it's still there because it's all being stored in a database and so on. So this is a fully functioning Trello application. And if we go back here to our editor, we can see that what I just did, it made a bunch of API calls, right? And so now we're ready to look a bit at the code. And this is the same principle that we looked at earlier, right? Where 
Uh, we have our, our Encore APIs. Our APIs are just functions. Now we're taking in request and response parameters. And these are actually uh, types where the fields are the uh, fields in our API. And this is the re re response type. And inside here, you know, to actually create a Trello board, it's very simple. We just insert it into the database. We get the ID back, and then we return the generated board. Uh, down here, we can see a bit more complicated API, which is to actually retrieve information about the board. And here, we can see that we're first uh, querying the database for it, but then we're using uh, an error group to do two things in parallel. So we're, we're doing an API call to fetch all the columns, and we're doing an API call to a different microservice to fetch all of the cards. And then we wait for this to complete, and then we, we merge them together, and we re uh, return the, the board. And so this is a bit more complicated, uh, but still you know, really simple. And when you're using Encore, uh, you get this really powerful uh, local development dashboard for uh, making it easier and faster to build your application. And what this does is uh, it enables us to do things like uh, generate API documentation for you. So what we're looking at here is the generated API documentation for your backend. And here you can see all of the APIs that we have defined. We can take a look at the, the board.create API, which, which I showed you earlier where we have things like uh, the input is the name of the board, the response are a bunch of fields, um, board, uh, board.get uh, is the thing I just showed you. We can even call it directly from uh, the documentation. So this is always up to date because it's based on under like parsing your uh, business logic. But it's also interactive. So you can even call it here and see the response and so on. And if we go back here, um, here you can see on the right hand side all of the requests that have been done. And with Encore, we even do this thing called distributed tracing, where when we run your application, we you know analyze and instrument your application with a bunch of like debugging information. And it lets us do things like build this really powerful view where you can understand exactly what happened to your request. So what I just showed you here earlier is this, uh, this API where we're first doing a database query. And then in parallel, we're calling uh, the list columns API and the car.list API. And if we go back here, we can see that this is exactly what happened. This is the board.get call. It made two API calls. And on the right-hand side, you can see that these two API calls were happening in parallel. So this is like a timeline view where you can see all the Go routines that were working to process this request. And the first thing that happened was a database query. As soon as it completed, we fired off two different Go routines. Uh, those Go routines made a list columns call uh, as well as a card.list call. And you can even see the request and the, the response data for each one. So this is super powerful for quickly finding bugs in your application and figuring out where the problem lies. You can even, for each event, you can even see where in the code base it happened. And then once you're happy with um, how things work, Deploying to production is just as easy as Git push Encore. And what this does is it pushes the code to our uh, cloud platform where you know, we'll parse all the, all the static analysis, we'll run the tests and the builds and so on. And once this is successful, then we'll actually set up all the infrastructure in the cloud. I haven't logged in. Good timing. 
So we'll give this a minute to send the email. And if we go back here, it's all streaming to our uh, terminal anyway, so we're not really missing anything. So once the test's complete, we'll set up all the infrastructure in the cloud. And then uh, that's happening now. We're setting up all the infrastructure. We're actually deploying it. And once this is completed, everything will be live running in production. So I'll open my, take this, go back here. And there you can see. So once this completes, we'll have our production environment up and running. Here you can get you know, everything from metrics and logs and tracing. You get API documentation. You can uh, browse the code if you'd like. And you can even deploy this to your own cloud. So instead of using Encore's cloud, you can just go and and select the cloud that you want to deploy to. And then everything will work the same way, except it will deploy to your own cloud account. So you have full control of all the infrastructure. And Encore is just there to help you ship faster. And that's it. Uh, the benefit of this is almost no boilerplate. Uh, we can do a lot of crazy stuff to help you get your work done faster from, you know, code generation to API documentation and tracing and so on. And all of this works everywhere, right? It works on your computer. It works in the cloud. It doesn't matter which cloud. It works in your test environment. It even works on each pull request. And that's really powerful because it means that wherever you find any problems, Encore makes it super easy to fix them. And Everything I just showed you is open source. Uh, everything from the parser and the compiler and the command line and the framework and the uh, API uh, documentation, it's all there. Um, and with that, uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you want to check out Encore, either check out our uh, repo or encore.dev. Happy to take any questions, of course. All right. Thank you, Andre. That was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have a few questions off on screen. Uh, if Stanley can help me pull out the questions on screen. Yeah. So first question, how would Encore work in a team setting? So I guess it's related to the second question. Would there be a need for the on-call parser running on each seat? Yeah. 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 So uh, great question. Um, the so Encore is definitely built for teams, right? Like everybody who is using Encore uh, are connected to the same cloud platform, which means that we can make it very, very powerful to actually collaborate between people. When you create a pull request, uh, Encore is actually connected to your uh, GitHub account. And in that, we actually create a dedicated uh, test environment for each pull request. Uh, we can also do things like uh, generate type safe front ends for, uh, you know, if it's TypeScript or, you know, any other language, we can generate a front end client that connects directly to your back end. So there is even no boilerplate necessary for uh, other developers too. So it's it's very much designed to be incredibly useful, not just to individual developers, but really uh, whole teams. Mm, OK, thanks for that. Second question also, Swin. Uh, do you have any bindings for other languages like Java or Python? Uh, no, it's really, you know, all of what I showed you is super uh, Go specific, right? Like everything from uh, the distributed tracing to how we're expressing, you know, uh, distributed systems concepts to doing like runtime instrumentation. We could certainly, you know, explore adding other languages, but right now we're focused on providing, you know, a 
10x improvement to productivity. And to do that, we really want to get super specific and deep into the language. So we're just focusing on Go for the, the backend experience, but we'll support lots of languages for you know integrating with, uh, when you want to integrate your Encore backend with other systems. So everything from JavaScript to Python and Java and, and so on. So that's, that's definitely uh, the plan. But in terms of how you write your backend logic, it's Go specific. Okay, okay, good to know that. Uh, all right, two more questions, one from Donaldson. Uh, the advantage of come combining infrastructure as code with business logic, usually we separate them. Hmm. Yeah, what's your viewpoint on this? We usually, we usually do them separately, but in my opinion, that's only because our tools don't actually make it very easy. In practice, you know, they are incredibly coupled. You know, when you're writing your business logic, you do that based on an understanding of how things are supposed to work in production. Uh, and so there is always this coupling between your business logic and your infrastructure. Uh, with Encore, when you're expressing, you know, doing a database query, you're doing it at a higher abstraction level where you're not saying, you know, connect to this database running in the cloud. You're saying there should be a database connected to this service. And Encore takes care to actually connect them together when it starts your application. So when you're running it on your computer, the database is running on your computer too. When you're doing it in a test environment, the database is like a very small test database. And when you're running it in production, it's a dedicated managed database that you know has uh, daily backups and you know uh, uh, read replicas and so on. So it's not coupled; it's just helping you by understanding what you're trying to do and making that easier. Mm. Okay, got it. All right. Um, another question, Saga. And we use Jira PC for communication between the services instead of REST. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Uh, right now, it's all HTTP. Uh, when you're defining multiple services within Encore, you know, you don't even have to think about the transport protocol. You just do it in terms of functions. And what's really nice about that, right, is uh, I guess I didn't show this, uh, but since it's all functions, you actually get you know code completion for your API calls, right? So your editor will actually autocomplete and tell you when you're doing something wrong with your API calls. Maybe I should actually show this because it's super powerful. We go back here. Yeah, so here we can see that this is an API call to car.list. Uh, but if I were to write this from scratch, you know, uh, I would do hard dot list, and you see you get compile time auto completion for all of this. Uh, even do it for the request parameters. Uh, so here you can see that this takes a board ID. And if you even get this wrong, say uh, you know you you thought it was uh, named something like this, the compiler will actually tell you like you're passing in the wrong data to your API. And this is super powerful because normally when you're doing API calls between services, you're never entirely sure that you're doing the right thing or that you're passing in, you know, if you're passing in a string instead of an integer, the compiler will also tell you. And if you're doing a refactoring, um, you go back here and you want to change the name of this to uh, something else. And the compiler will actually, you know, refactor this for you. And so that's really the benefit of using Encore between services is it becomes much more type safe than the alternative. And uh, when you then save it, library loads and so on. So the, the transport protocol between services doesn't really matter because it's more in terms of functions and data uh, structures. Uh, over time, we will add support for gRPC, um, but 
the real goal is to not think about that so much and more think about your business logic and think at a higher abstraction level. Mm, okay. Maybe we can have one last question is from Donaldson. Oh, I see his backend code. What about front end coding? Yeah, so Encore is very much a backend framework. It's uh, everything is designed for solving backend uh, challenges. So defining APIs, building backend services, making API calls between them. We do make it easier to integrate it with your front end. So, uh, for example, if we go back here, and so a common a common challenge you have as a front end developer is actually uh, to actually call the back end API. So with Encore, um, you can generate a type safe uh, front end client just using Encore Gen Client, and this will be fully type safe, fully documented, and just ready to use with all the types you need. So. That means that as a front-end developer, all you need to do is instantiate this, specify the environment, and then you can call the API like this. So we do make it easier for front-end developers too, but it's very much designed to solve back-end challenges because that's where there has been a lot of innovation on the front-end side, and there has been not so much innovation on making it easier to build backends. So that's what, what we're focusing on. And then there are lots of other great uh, tools for making front-end development more productive. OK, cool, very cool. OK, let's see. Let's one last look at the questions. Any more? Now it looks like we are done. All right. Thank you, Andre. I'm sure some of you have more questions. Feel free to reach out to Andre and uh, yeah. have a chat and offline. Check out and call out Dev or the GitHub. Mm. All right. Um, we're going to take a short break now uh, and socialize over Gather Town. And uh, the link has been pasted in, a, in the YouTube channel. So uh, see you guys there. Uh, in, uh, we'll be there for 15 minutes and we'll come back here again for the second talk uh, before we close off the day. Uh, thank you again, Andre. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See you guys then.
Hi. Welcome back. Here's some echo in my uh we have Donaldson. This is the second talk. And Donaldson will talk about how not to program in Go. So without further ado, over to you, Donaldson. Yeah, please go ahead. Hey, Donaldson, I think your mic is muted. Up, so sorry Hello. for the technical difficulties. Yep. Uh, everyone, give so, us a while while we try to figure this out. Uh, don't also you can the, try sharing your screen. In the meantime, we are just gonna talk nonsense to entertain you. <laughs> so, can you Any feature your dog? Any hidden talents Jessie? you have? <laughs> uh, my dog. Um, yeah, it's a talent show. Uh, Stanley. I'm not good with talent show. Yep, my dog is in the living room. So can you feature your dog? Maybe you become Maybe. a YouTube star. <laughs> Maybe next time. Oh by the way, folks, uh yeah, if you if you still want to join the post uh socializing post meetup socializing later uh just drop us a message over meetup.com with your email and we add you to the guest list we try to have more seats available for everyone but yeah we have limited capacity so first come first serve. It's pretty awesome the platform look like a Pokemon game. <laughs> How I spent my childhood. How long <laughs> did you spend uh, building the the town? Oh actually it's a template from uh from from Gathered on Town. The whole room is the template, but I replaced the towns with some drawings using the different kind of towns. So I, I drew a gopher in the middle. Yeah, it looks really cute. Yeah. But I think yeah, socializing in person is still much better. Just that we are we unfortunately can't. But I mean the good side is that we can have people from overseas. Like mm. Andre. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. 
Donaldson is still trying to fix his hardware. Yep. The, uh, that's the thing about live events, right? When something <laughs> happens, you can't physically be there to help. So yeah. we're just here to um, store the time, I guess. It was still working before the meetup. So sorry. Yeah. But yeah, why don't we? Oh, Saga says, gather is a great way to socialize. Yeah, why don't we do some uh, Golang quiz? So maybe I can give out some free uh, uh, Golang license. Yeah, let's do some quiz in the comments section. Okay, let me find something. Give me a moment. All right, all right. Uh, Okay, we're gonna be a first come first serve. Who got the right answer first? Second. Okay, hang on. Uh, go online quiz. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Ah, I just got electro people. What? Yeah, because I, I was plugging in my. External monitor. Please stay okay. safe. Otherwise, it's gonna turn into a very interesting live stream. <laughs> yeah, or <On> death stream. <laughs> Get it? Oh god. Okay. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna present some uh, Golang quiz. Okay. Let's okay. try um adding Donaldson in. Oh. To see if we can hear. Donaldson him. is back. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, Donaldson, can you say something? Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, nice. Great. Nice. I don't have to play the. Golden we'll leave your quiz for another day, Stanley. <laughs> All don't right. worry. Yeah. Okay. okay let me um, reconfigure everything. Yep. Yep, all good, Donaldson. We can hear you and we see your slides. Okay, Shen, when can I start? Yep, you can start now. Okay, uh, so I'm going to share on uh, how not to program in Go. These are basically uh, essence from uh, code reviews. So how many of you have you all uh, done code reviews as part of your sprint? Right, sometimes people do, sometimes People don't because we are rushing for time, but code reviews are actually quite useful. So you actually see some of these problems that are popping up during code reviews. So I'm just sharing them. So who am I? I'm Donna. I'm currently a senior engineer at Quinkus. So Quinkus is a logistics uh, software as a service provider. So my background is uh, previously I work on network infrastructure, so I program content delivery networks, software defined networks, and uh, P2P networks. So it's just a shout out from a company. We are hiring uh, Go developers and uh, data engineers. So if you're interested, you can just go and look at the company website. So why this talk, right? This talk is uh, inspired by Effective Go. Right? So Effective Go provides a reference for idiomatic Go, right? But that is just not enough. Sometimes you need to know what are the common goal mistakes and avoiding them. So it makes us also a bit more effective goal programmer. So what, what are the common issues that we we'll always see, right? So when we, when we go through the code, some, some of the common problems we always see is, uh, is, that, is that some developers, when they, when they uh, experience an error, they will call panic. So, so why, why, why does this happen, right? Typically, I think in most cases, when we started learning Go, the first thing we learned in the, in the, in the Hello World example of panic error, we always see that if a not equal new, we just panic. That is the, that is the one very, one of the first things we learn when we learn Go, right? So some of these habits will just carry on, but actually in a production environment, right? It's a bad idea. Why? 
because the parametric signature right of a function right in this case function get weather right you cannot it does not indicate whether the function will throw a panic or not, return an error you simply have no idea so if a third party throws a panic there's no way for the programmer to know right so the programmer cannot anticipate he cannot recover from it so this is why panic is usually a bad practices especially for product for production environment but is there a good use for panic yes sometimes like for example when when you are deep in the in the function call stack you might not want to propagate an error across the entire stack so you just want to clean break then you just panic to just exit the program right but that is only for very rare circumstances but most of the time you want to handle the error instead of panicking the error So the next part, the next one is uh, making a rest call, right? This is also another common error. Can you see what's wrong with this code? It's not very obvious, right? Everything seems here looks normal. But actually it's not. So, uh, has anyone still be able to figure out what is the error here? Okay, the error here, right, is basically that there is something wrong with the HTTP client. So, when the server, so when the server api.mycompany.com doesn't respond, this program basically hangs because the, there is no timeout. So the, the, the default HTTP client, the net HTTP package actually has a zero timeout. So the program just hangs, right? So if you use a default client in, micro, in the production environment, this can, especially in the microservice, this can lead to cascading failures, right? So uh, actual very very simple solution is to just indicate a timeout when you instate the H when you start the http client it's just a very simple thing but this is actually very common this is a very common thing it actually happens very frequently you see during code reviews so the the other one another common issue we always see is uh is logging right is uh, during logging there are problems right and the most common problem is people are not logging useful stuff right they are just showing a lot of uh, extra information that might not be useful right so you look at this code right this code actually shows you a lot of uh, useful things like when the http method is wrong it will lock with the wrong http method right but then you need to ask yourself if you are the desktop person, right, receiving the lock, how does the message look like? So the very first thing, right, you want to know, right, as a desktop person, when you receive the lock stream, right, is you want to know what, in, what is the start of the lock stream and when, when is the end of the lock stream. So then you can identify to say that uh, these locks are for a specific process that is encapsulated within these two locks that indicate the start and the end. Then you will know, ah, yes, I am now tracing the log for this particular process. So the very key thing is that the log messages must enable, right? To the applicant must enable the DevOps personnel to troubleshoot the, the application, right? So when you look at the code, right, there are certain problems here, right? Like if you look at like if you look at line nine, it just says it rocks. It just says it's the wrong method. But then you want to know, when you want to troubleshoot, you want to know what was the actual method being called, right? So you need to lock the, the actual method name into it. So this is things that you need to know to actually to make sure that your logging is useful. So the other one, for example, here is 
Like for example, when you want to lock the get payload, when there is an error, you want to check, you did not lock what the actual payload but the actual payload is, right? So people want to see what the request body is. So when they see the request body, then they know, oh, this is wrong. That's why that thing could not work. So you need to lock all that in to get the, the information correct. So now, so this is just some code that shows the, 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 the logging, which is uh, being corrected. So that now the logging is more meaningful. So the next one, right, is a common problem when you are passing JSON. So we always, we often we use the encoding JSON library to pass the JSON, but then there are problems with the encode with the encoding JSON, right? So primarily, right, when we encode the JSON in this case, right, the main issue here is default values. So open default values. So we know, right, that normally when we when when we go and uh, unmarshal the the body, right, the information is actually outside our control. So it is not entirely. So it might not be correct, right? So we might expect the JSON body to contain the field rejectable, but actually the field reject rejectable might not be there. So what happens when you unmarshal the thing? So if the rejectable field is orbital, right? You will find that the payload value of reject job will also be false because that is the default value for that struct. So this gives you a problem that Sometimes when you unmarshal when you unmarshal the JSON, you will not get the correct you that the JSON you get when you pass the JS the is not the correct one. So you need to be very wary of this. And then the other next, the next one, the another one commonly that pop up is what I call awkward hash map. So why why is it an awkward hash map? So you look at in this case, right? The awkward hash map, right, is basically you've seen that a lot of people use this shortcut where they make a map of a, of type with a key string and type data type interface, so they can put any data in. So it's very convenient and put in few, right? So so why 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 does all these things make things awkward? So the main why it's not over is because this kind of code is not maintainable because the key string values right are buried inside the function. So imagine right, you are being asked to add a new function to process this job map. What will you do? Right, you imagine you, you now the developer, now you have to go and deep dive in the code to find out what the actual, actual key string what the actual key strings are because you might only know them during runtime or you might not know them or, or actually you might know them before runtime, right? So it will be actually very frustrating to work on, right? So I would call such practices, right? The Go code is not very, not maintainable because it's not easy to discover what are these key string values are. And then not to mention, there's also a loss of information, right? Specifically the data type, because when you recast a, a data from one data type to interface, you lose the information. So the best way is to just simply avoid this kind of awkward hash map, use a struct. Your code will be much more maintainable. So next time when someone, somebody goes through the code, they need to work on that hash map. They now have a struct. We have a well-defined fields. They all know what is it meant for. And then this one, the next issue is uh, the the other issue now is a uh, slice manipulation, right? So slice is very very common in Go. So sometimes small sometimes small little things we do in Go, right, might actually have a big impact. So like for example, we have two we have two strings, right? Two slices, right? S one and S two, right? So S two points to S1, right? So when we update S2, in this case, we actually update S1. 
So as you can see in uh, in uh, between line nine and line thirteen, when we update S two, we update S one. So now there's a, this funny behavior right? when when we actually go and uh, update. Now when we want to go and uh, grow the size of S two, right? So we want to add another one. And suddenly we realize this breaks the underlying reference. Now when you update S2, it no longer update S1. So if you look at the code, it looks fine, it compiles fine, but actually it breaks the underlying logic and it's not obvious that the logic breaks. So again, this is another form of common error that also pops up. So this is uh, just me just sharing uh, some frequent go pitfalls that I come across in my work. Uh. Do I have any questions? Hey, thank you so much, Donaldson, for the insightful talk. Uh, let me see if we have any question over in the comment sections. All right, I think I think whatever that you are preaching is too true that no one seems to have any. <laughs> opinions oh. otherwise <laughs> all right oh yeah actually sangha sangha is uh, asking for your opinion on how do you suggest we handle jason unmarshalling issue so you mentioned something about uh jason unmarshalling So oh, normally what I do is uh, I avoid I avoid binary I avoid uh, binary data types. So binary data types are, are data types that has only two values. So for example, boolean is either true or false. Oh, but so, uh... so instead of true or false, I will just simply use a string instead that says true instead of the actual boolean value. And then okay. the other case is when I'm dealing with numbers, I avoid using zero as the minimum value. Because zero is another case where you unmarshal, you omit zero will be the default value. So you in when you are programming it, you make sure that that you know that zero should not count, should not count for a value when you are accept when you are reading that zero value. That is one way to avoid this issue uh, if you must insist on using if you using numbers there's actually another school of thought uh in dealing with those binary and numbers by using pointers what do you think is a superior approach or like or the pros and cons of two ways one that you're mentioning which is using string and the other one which is using uh pointers uh what pointers oh so for dealing with uh ambiguous value in go oh no, so no like, the ambiguous yeah. value is due to when you write in a in a json string mm -hmm. it comes on a json string so there's no pointer yeah but like uh so go default now value of like numbers and booleans to false and zero right so we could deal with those by using pointers so yeah, that's just an alternative to your suggestion of using string, right? So yeah, I think Dicky also wanted to ask about that. Mm -hmm. So like, mm -hmm. yeah, what do you think about these two different approach? Like, oh, I haven't tried pointer before. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, cool. Okay, then I guess, yeah, we can bring this to the next discussion.
Uh, okay, let's move on to the next question. So to so uh, Kang Ming is asking uh, if we want to write an endpoint past the request params and body, is it preferred if we use a struct instead of a map? No, it's fine using a map. It's fine using a map. A struct is more for like we are passing something from one function to another function. Internally, you can use a map. It's not an issue. You you get from internally. You want to use a map within a function is 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 okay, right? The main thing is the map will become extremely unwieldy when you say when you have more than five key key more than five key strings. So suddenly, when you realize that you're dealing a map with 20, 20 or thirty key strings, suddenly you realize it's not possible to remember or keep track all of them mentally in your head. And that's when you prefer to have a struct to deal with it. Then every time you check, then you see, ah, I know this is the correct data type. This is the thing. So it actually reduces your mental load. And also easy for other people to look up in future. Because once you have too many key strings, it's hard to manage. Cool. Why is good? Uh, let me see if we have more questions in the comment comment section. Let's not. Let's give another couple of minutes. Yeah. So Donaldson, just wanna uh, draw a bit on your experience. So like, uh, I believe that you came to go from a background of another language, right? So uh, what do you think is the best thing about Go compared to your previous experience with another language? Uh, previously, I was using uh, I was using a lot of uh, Python and Java. But everyone knows the regular the where complaint of Python and Java is just there's there's too there's too much uh, boilerplate code. Where else, uh, when I wanted to do networking stuff, I realized Python is just not good enough to deal with uh, low level stuff. I can use Python for 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 orchestrating uh, network devices. I can use Python for orchestrating virtual machines. But when you ask me to use Python for Packet processing, right? It's it's not very. It's just not very good at doing that job, and uh, and the way uh, the main thing about Python that irks me, right, is sometimes. I get the data type wrong. I get the I I get the data type wrong. So when I write in the code, I actually have no idea. This is a big problem, especially when you do a big code base. You really lose track of all the functions, really. So I need a way to allow me to quickly check whether the code is uh, is at least uh, correct when I'm using the type. So Go is actually very convenient. Oh. Interesting. So that's like a move from a dynamic language yeah. to a. So once you have too many variables, you want to use language features to help you to reduce complexity in managing your code. Mm. I think, yeah, a lot of startups, when they evolve from a early stage to a more organized and like a larger organization size. They tend to do that as well to put more order in place. That's quite natural, I believe. All right, I think we are we've come to the end of the meetup. It's almost eight thirty. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Donaldson. The talk was really helpful. I think like these are like small tips, but I think it can really contribute a lot when we we pay more attention to those things in our code bases. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Thanks, thank Donaldson, and thank you so much, everyone, for coming in and join us today.
in the stream. Uh, we was we would still have like some socializing after the meetup in gather. If you still wanna join, yeah, we we'll still be open there for a few more minutes. Uh, yeah, and uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we see you next month. Bye. Bye. -bye.